So welcome everybody to one more iteration of Montreal MLOPT, our public seminar. This week we're very excited to have uh, Lorenzo Rosasco, uh, who is at the uh, Università degli Studi di Genova. I probably mangled that, I'm sorry. And at MIT, also affiliated with MIT. is uh, a great figure in optimization. And today he's going to give us an implicit tour of regularization. So thank you so much for the honor, Lorenzo. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Anis. Thank, uh, thank uh, you all for, for coming in. Um, it's fun to see a few f friendly faces in these times. Um, so yeah, so the, it's, it, as you see, you know, I, I have always been doing something a mix between uh, uh, inverse problems, statistics, optimization, and this team implicit regularization, which is something very, it's a very, very old idea, which came out, became very fashionable in machine learning the last few years, uh, is really a mix of many of these things. And so, um, as you'll see, I'm not going to, I'm going to flood you with details, and it's going to be really more of a tour, try to get an idea of, you know, you know, where some, something something that probably at this point everybody know and some more recent results and what we know and what we don't. And I will not probably go and deep in all the details of all the uh, special results that came out in the last few years. But again, I try to give a bird eye view and hopefully they will be still interesting enough. Uh, if there's time, I can skip stuff. So just stop me. Uh, I should be like, wait, we'll see. <clears throat> so I should say, you know, my, my partner in crime for most of this stuff is Silvia Villa. She's the real optimization person in, in, my, in, my, in my gang. <clears throat> She's a professor. And then the, the Cesare Maturan Vasilis are postdocs in, uh, in Genova. All right, so um, I'm basically just going to uh, warm things up a bit just by introducing a problem. As you'll see, I will somewhat move between machine learning and inverse problems, and I'll try to emphasize some basic ideas. <clears throat> and then uh, I will discuss. Uh, uh, Again, I will introduce the, the notion of implicit regularization uh, that I also like to call iterative regularization. And then I'll try to introduce different flavors, what we know and what we don't, OK? All right, so, <clears throat> so um, the kind of problem that I have in mind is this problem where there is uh, some, some map between you know, some input and output. And then you get input-output pairs, and you have to recover the map, OK? That's the basic idea. Uh, I'm a bit vague about the precise set. Sometimes we will see I'm going to consider x and y being random, the noise being random. Other time I'm going to assume things being more deterministic. Okay, I'll be precise when it's needed. But so let's just say in the situations where you have to estimate a functional relationship given input and output pairs, uh, I think we can all agree that the classic way of this by defining some objective function based on the data um, again empirical risk minimization. The ingredients are a few. You need to define a cost function, a loss function, to measure errors on your data. You need to define some function model. You have to estimate this function class, and uh, uh, you have to say how it looks like. And here, you have five gazillions way of doing this, but here I just mentioned two, the one that are linearly parameterized. So there is maybe some nonlinear map, but the parameters enter linearly in your function, or the one that are no linearly parameterized. Um, and so you can think of, say, kernel methods or linear models on the one hand and the neural networks on the other hand as the primary example. And then most of the time what happens is for a bunch of reasons, uh, you have some bias, you have some uh, prior, you can call it whichever way you want. You know that among possible solutions you want to be geared toward, you want to be pointing in some that this is encoded in some functional, I call it here R, uh, riser or whatever you want to call it. And I think here, you know, uh, uh, a Euclidean norm or an L1 norm, a total variation norm, you name it. I mean, there is a huge list. Th this is, I think this is in the bag of the way you build algorithms. This is probably like the very first step uh, for most people. Um, and then typically, and again, apologies, this is a bit of a cartoon. And then optimization comes afterwards. First, you, you spend time thinking about this objective. And that's oftentimes the work of, say, the statistician or the algorithm designer. And then you go, you know, to 
to Ioannis or to Silvia or to me when I'm awake. Uh, and okay, how, how do I get a solution? Because this is not a real algorithm. This is an algorithm in a statistical sense. It's a procedure. But how do I get something out of the computer? And then you have to do perform computations. And these days, uh, what works are typical you know, gradient-based method because they are maybe not the fastest compared to you know, uh, other techniques, but they're easy to implement on large-scale scenarios. And so here, basically, uh, I, again, I'm, I put here the gradient, might be this a gradient, might be you know, stochastic, non-stochastic, you name it. We all want to go super fast, super efficient, and that's where optimization enters. And there is this kind of this dichotomy, right? There is on the one hand the uh, objective function design and then how you solve it. And the, the two things are don't really go, I mean, of course they're connected, but they're really oftentimes separate processes, okay? Uh, they take advantage of uh, each other's decision, but they're somewhat separate. All right, again, cartoon, and of course, I'm not ignoring the fact there are tons of people that are somewhat in the middle, but I still fail to say that, you know, majority of is most of the time in either one camp or the other, okay? All right, there is a caveat, which is kind of important for my personal motivation, which is that when you, read, when you say that you run the optimization it's not really ever one one iteration you typically have to choose the parameter of your model and this is going to cost you solving not one optimization problems but many optimization problems okay let's say you know i have to choose the the lambda in this objective function you'll have to solve this problem for many lambdas and then i will have some criterion to pick the best lambda okay let's say cross-validation. I'm not gonna discuss a good criterion, but I say cross-validation is probably the one that most people do, which basically means that if you go in and just count of compute optimization you have to go, you have to do several full uh, run of a gradient method all the way down to the end, as many times as the number of hyperparameters you wanna try, okay? And of course, you can be smart about it. You can do some kind of warm restart, decide which parameters you wanna try first and so on, and again, but yeah, that's what you have to do. Okay, and I think that's what you usually do. So far, so good. All right. And then in some sense, there is a very simple case which somewhat shows that there's something else that could happen instead of least squares, okay? So in, this is the case where I pick the loss function to be the square loss and I take my function to be linear. And I, I, I can generalize this quite a bit, but this is the easy case, okay? Because here, all of a sudden, you can give a closed form solution to the, say, pen, uh, um, uh, squared norm penalized empirical risk minimization solution. It's just the ridge regression, okay? You have the square in the loss, the square in the penalty, you take gradients, you get the linear system. And here, x is the data matrix, x transpose, uh, sorry, y is the output vectors, and this is the explicit form, okay? And what do we care about this? Because, uh, you know, it's a known fact that when uh, you let the number of, you, 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 when you let the regularization parameter lambda to zero, you convert to the minimal norm interpolating solution, okay? And I'm assuming that such things exist. So see that among all possible solutions, you're biased towards the one with the minimal norm, okay? You don't just select a solution, you don't just select a fitting solution. In some sense, you pick the simplest solution according to the notion of simplicity encoded by this norm. All right? You see, more than that, as you change lambda, you are somewhat uh, exploring a set of solution going towards this bias. Okay? So you somewhat, in the space of possible solution, you somewhat plot a trajectory which is governed by this lambda. Now, as it turns out, if you now do gradient descent on least squares with a constant step size that allows you to get convergence, so the standard choice, then what happens is that as the number of iteration goes to infinity, you go in the very same place, okay? You don't just fit the solution, but you go to the, to, to the minimum norm solution. This, the easiest way, I'm not, I'm not showing this at this point. I imagine that many of you do know this fact. It's a simple fact. The easiest way to see it is just remember that the minimum norm solution is the unique solution in the uh, orthogonal to the range, which is in the orthogonal of the null space of your data. Okay, or rather, it's in the, in the is in the span of your data. And so, 
here you can see that basically if you start within the span of your data, you stay within because the gradient is in the span of your data. So in some sense, you start, you know, you, you start within the span of your data and you're gonna convert to the unique solution inside of there. So that's, you know, okay, that's a one quick way to just check that this is true, okay? But it's more than that. What you can hope is that as you change lambda, as you change well, as you change t, as you, ex you as you run iteration, you will somewhat explore the space of solution in a way similar to with lambda. So in some sense, the, the hope here is that as you move t, as you increase the number of iteration, you will do something similar to what you do when you change lambda. So that you get to the same place, you can ask yourself if you will have the same property along the way. And that's somewhat this idea of implicit bias, also called iterative regularization. It's implicit. I mean, after you know it, it's not implicit anymore. Okay, you just know that gradient descent is going to the words the mean and solution. But it's called implicit because it does not come out of an explicit constraint or penalty on an objective function. It's really the optimization that somehow goes there. And the classical name is iterative regularization because it's really the number of iteration that has a capability of somewhat following the regularization path. Okay? Uh, and this opens a number of opportunities. Of course, at this point, you could ask yourself, okay, but you know, this is hand wavy. Can you somewhat prove this? And here I'm just showing you one possible result, which you should take as a, a proof of concept. Okay. And this is the case where you take a statistical learning setting where you assume your input and outputs to be from some uh, distribution and the data to be IID. And, I, and again, this is the simplest result. I, I write this because it's the simple result I can write. The data are bounded. The true function of my problem, the one that does not minimize the test error, is linear. And then what you have is that you have a result for uh, you have a result for ridge regression, which basically say if you choose the uh, regularization parameter lambda going to zero in a given though, you get a, a bound. And it turns out that if you choose the number of iteration going to infinity, you get this bound. Okay. So if you know bounds, you might get nervous because you can say, oh, this is one of the square root of n, it's super slow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I just showed you the best bound you can get, but just to show you a simple result, OK? Particularly, this is a, a dimension-free bound. So I'm a that could actually be infinite dimensional, as it happens when you have feature maps. Uh, but for if you assume that your data are finite dimensional, you get something that is more like 1 over n. And again, you can get better rates, faster rates, fancier rates. That's not the point here. The point is just to show you that this intuition that comes out of this observation that you go to the same minimal norm is actually showed up here. Okay. Uh, and again, I'm going a bit quick here because this is a bit at this point is classical stuff. You know, this is the first time I met it. So I, I was studying this during my PhD, which is now really a long time ago. And then, uh, and, and this is a very classical idea. And we somewhat I discovered that uh, one could do this for. Uh, learning too. And again, here I, I just quote one paper and uh, old one, one, and the list of people that made this observation is, is very, very long. Okay. I saw the name of Stefan Canu uh, at some point. Uh, you know, we met around that time and he was definitely looking at this kind of stuff. So it's really a lot of people. Okay. So again, this, this is the, the first step of inception. Okay. So uh, hopefully this, th this is the idea. Okay. <laughs> so the, the idea is uh, optimization can do what, pena what penalization do does, and the number of iteration can parameterize my solution the same way that lambda uh, does. Okay. Again, at this point, if you've seen this before, it's obvious or it's not so surprising. Uh, the first time you see it, you're like, "Oh, that's that's new." Okay. Uh, all right, so I, I, I'll pause a second. I, I don't know if I can see if you're asking questions. I think you can see it. If you have any, if you have any question or you want to interrupt here, you know, this is my-, my I will also make sure that uh, questions are, are relayed to you, Lorenzo. I will monitor the, the chat if you want to be- Okay, there, thanks. Please. Yep. Okay, anyway. <laughs> 
so uh, again, I, I, I only see six faces. So sorry if it was too simple. Apologies if this was too rush. If you've never seen it before, but hopefully you'll get the, you, you get the basic idea. Okay. So let, let me add a couple of remarks. Okay. This idea, pretty much as it is, is from 1950s. Okay. There are these papers in linear system. Uh, this, this algorithm, a gradient descent there is uh, called for a weird reason, Land Weber iteration. And here I just mentioned a couple of books. One is a generic one on inverse problem. One is actually called iterative regularization or inverse problems. So there are books about these topics. There is a ton of results on these topics. Okay. And in machine learning, uh, it's, it's a well-known trick. It's a trick that has been known since a long, long time, and is special particularly been training neural networks since the 80s, at the very least. Um, and right now, it's kind of hot in machine learning. And there is a bit this tension of what shall we call this iterative? Well, iterative, nobody in machine learning call it, despite it being the classic name. You call it uh, implicit bias. Sometimes it's the early side. And the emphasis oftentimes is whether the important is where you go or how you go there, and if you have to stop early. And maybe I want to make just a comment about this, because in the time of interpolation, seeing this story that you have to stop early rather than maybe is a little bit confusing. And so maybe let me make a comment about that. OK? So what I want to show you is just gradient descent at work in something that you can plot. OK? So you get a feeling of what's going on. So this is a, a one-dimensional regression problem. And, I, and the blue points are the data. And the red curve is the iteration of gradient descent. So I start from 0, and then I start to evolve this iteration. And here I just show you, you know, you start to feed the data, OK? Then after seven iteration, you see that you start to do a, what you would visually would call a good job, because you probably don't want to follow everything. But then if you keep on going, then you fear that it freaks out. OK? So this gives you an intuition. And it gives you an intuition of why you might want to stop early. OK? So now you can stop a second and compare this to what you would do when you do Tikhon of regularization, or in what, what you do empirical risk minimization. So with empirical risk minimization, you have to choose many lambda, do all the possible iterations all the way down, and then choose the best lambda with cross-validation. Here, what you can do is you can just run one iteration and stop it when validation curve going up, and that's it. So in some sense, you have to trade many optimization problems all the way to the end with one optimization problem stop early. OK? And so that's why people look at this, because there is a gain in terms of efficiency. Rather than having the number of iteration controlling the time complexity and lambda controlling the statistical complexity, here the two things overlap. You have one parameter that at the same time controls the statistical stability of your estimator and the number of computation. And so you can pick picking one, you pick the other. So that's, that's again, it's kind of a, uh, elegant in a way, because you, for one for, you know, you just one parameter in place of two. Now, this intuition here, low dimensional, OK, data in high dimensional presumably will not look like this. If you look at the minimal norm solution here, it will actually be very bad because the points are the data are noisy and points are very close. So the minimal norm solution that interpolates your data will oscillate a lot. Okay, the picture might be very different in high dimension because presumably what happens in high dimension is that data are very far away. Okay, because they are in you know, and when I say high dimension, I mean even after you know if you're in dimension seven. OK, not a million or, or, or 10,000. So pr 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 presumably, when you go high in dimension, it, the, you might want to stop early, but maybe you don't have to stop super early. And maybe the, the minimal norm solution is important. OK, and that's a model observation that has been done recently quite a bit. You, in high dimension, where data are very far away, maybe the minimal norm solution is just good enough. So you want to use not that much the early stopping side of this story, but more just the final implicit bias side of this story. And so you somewhat can connect this to the observation that when you run a very highly parameterized model, you don't seem to overfit. And one guess is that because at the end of the day, you don't select just any solution, but the minimal norm solution. 
And again, here the minimal noise solution in this plot would be very bad, but you can imagine that in high dimension, it would probably be a pretty good, a pretty good uh, uh, solution. Again, because somewhat points are sparse and you don't really see these high oscillations in your function. Again, so these, are, these were my two cents to connect you to the interpolation and the implicit bias versus early stopping view on this kind of stuff. For the remainder of the talk, I will not care, okay? Because my, my question will just be, we learned a trick to turn, uh, you know, a variational problem into an iterative approach, a penalization approach into an iterative approach. How general is this, okay? That's the kind of question we want to ask. This, this trick that we've seen for gradient descent, how general that is, what do we know? And so now, of course, once you have this, you can somewhat start to play games and revisit everything. For example, okay, I did gradient descent, but we all know that you can accelerate gradient descent, that you can distribute gradient descent, that you can take stochastic gradients. So what about this stuff? What is their effect, okay? And notice that maybe one thing I should say that now you care more about the test error than the training. You don't want to just converge super fast to small training. You really would like to see what are the generalization property of that method. And so you can revisit different optimization techniques, different loss function, different bias, and different models, okay? So here, basically for the rest of the talk, I just want to give you a tour of what I think that we know and what I think we don't know, okay? All right, I cannot talk about everything. And so I'm gonna you know, highlight a couple of things and discuss a couple of more some others. One thing I'm gonna tell you about real quick is other kind of optimization, okay? So first of all, and I'm gonna discuss two things, acceleration and stochastic gradients. So uh, again, the difference with the kind of optimization results you know is that here, we are looking at learning, and the goal is not to see the effect of acceleration on training performance, but rather on test performance, okay? And this is only for least squares. There are a few results, but not many for other loss functions, okay? Pretty limited. And so here, quite a few things have been studied, for example, conjugate gradient, Nassar acceleration, heavy ball, and a couple of variation. And the long story short is that the fact that your algorithm converges fast is balanced by the fact that there is some form of instability showing up. And so the, co the joint effect of these two things is that you have to stop early. So you do gain, okay, in the sense that you will have to, you can stop your algorithm early and achieve the same result. So the big difference, say, if this, again, in this picture, where this, say, is gradient descent, number of iteration, and this is the test error, This would be, say, accelerated gradient descent, and this would be gradient descent, okay? And again, I'm assuming I am in a context where I have a U-shaped curve, okay? So don't go in berserk or what, what about double descent? I'm just taking a simple scenario here, okay? You can imagine similar behavior if you have a different shape or shifted on the left, okay? That, that's the basic idea, okay? So it's just easier to present in this set. And then you can do a look at stochastic stuff, and then you can use averaging or mini batching and so on. And then what you see is that again, in the end of the day, all these methods from a pure statistical point of view, you don't gain anything at all, okay? They achieve the exact same rates because by the way, these rates are not improvable. But what you see is that you gain from a computational point of view. When you move from batch to gradient descent, you see that rather than having to look at all the data at every iteration, you can actually do one pass over the data. And in this setting that I'm concerned, where every dimension, you have to take uh, uh, this when step size, but you can actually take a constant if you start to use mini batch. okay? So in some sense, you can now combine all these different uh, flavors and try to get the same statistical results with improved efficiency. Quick question. Again, this is a, yes. So, uh, at the top of the screen, I guess we're looking at prescriptions and when to stop. These are early stopping times as a function yes. of the size of the data set. So yes. if, if t equals root 10, that, that basically means 
I guess this is is this for full gradients or for stochastic the top half? Is it exclusively for the, the top is for for full gradient? Okay. Okay. I think that for for stochastic, I'm basically telling you that you can go to and step, but in each step you look at one point. So in some, if you do square root of n step of uh, batch gradient, you will look at the data. You know, square root of n times n times in stochastic gradient, you look at them n times. So uh, it's as you expect, it's much more efficient from that point of view. Okay. But he, and here the game is I'm fixing the optimal statistical rates and I just see how much computation you can shave off by doing things smarter. Again, this is this is a teaser. Okay. You just and you, you, what you get you should get out of this is that a few things are known, but not like the ton of stuff we know in optimization. Okay. So if you think of how many papers there are in optimization to speed up stuff and all kinds of tricks, the number of tricks that we know the for which we know the effect on the test error is very limited, okay? And so this is somewhat a game that you can play because you can play any favorite tricks and just put it here. And this is just to show you the few that I'm aware of. All right, so the one thing I want to talk about a bit more is how you change your bias, okay? How you change the, the, the uh, form, how do you guide a design algorithm to <coughs> express different bias? And this is easy peasy in the case of uh, uh, empirical risk minimization, because what you have to do is instead of, you know, the, the square norm, now you just have to take here some other penalty. That's it. Okay. If, but the question now is, what do you do here? What about doing it in a tier iterative technique? Okay. So, if R is this is the Euclidean norm, you can now take the gradient descent. But what do you take if you want to enforce a different path? Okay, and it turns out that the the the, the thing here is a bit more uh, sparse. Okay, and so the easy case, the one that has been studied a bit more, is if this pen is this R is strongly convex. Okay. And in this case, essentially, you can do this technique. So here, you, you can call this a couple of different ways. It's essentially the gradient descent in the dual, OK? Or you can call it mirror descent. The key point here is that, as I recalled in the footnote, the gradient of the dual can be expressed in closed form as a proximity operator, OK? And you can see this if you express R as the sum of a convex plus a strongly convex term, OK? And plus a Euclidean, a squared Euclidean norm. So in this case, that you can do a relatively simple algorithm, which is, again, a simple first order method. It's just a mirror step of mirror descent. And this has been studied quite a bit, OK? Uh, of course, you know, mirror descent is a super well-known algorithm. So the, the novelty here is really the application is to design a, 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 iterative regularization, you know, an iterative technique that will convert to the among all the possible solution to the one with minimal that minimize this bias, okay, is, is driven to this bias. <clears throat> so this observation was made by a few people. Uh, it's interesting here because Henning and uh, Martin Berger and others come from inverse problems. And this is something that's been going on for several years. They have a series, a long series of work on this. Their main motivation was say image processing with total variation or some other form of inverse problems. And then uh, Surya Guneskar, Natiz Rebo, and other colleagues uh, noticed these things more recently for machine learning. And we actually had a paper for a couple of years ago when we studied this. this paper, we noticed that one thing you could do, you could also accelerate this, OK? You can add the momentum, and then you could expect to have faster convergence rate. And this is just the nest of acceleration. So the question here is, can we try to study the properties of this? And ideally, what we'd like to show you now is some learning results I could show you before. But it turns out that at least uh, for us, and I'm not aware of results, where people can prove similar results for machine learning or statistical learning. So what I'm going to show you are a slightly different setting, OK? It's a setting where you have, oh, let me mistake here, you have, um, I have, you have a linear map, okay, from two spaces, 
And so in some sense, imagine a case where you just have an infinite linear system, okay? Again, I, I want to work in infinite dimensions just because these mag it's infinite dimensions are, are a magnifying glass for instability. So if you're looking at regularization, it's somewhat the easy setting to see the big effect, okay? And so I'm going to assume that you have this uh, system. And then I'm going to assume there is a specific form of noise, which is the one here, which is deterministic, okay? You can imagine this as a case where essentially you have fixed data, in input data, and the noise in the output is the worst case. It's not stochastic mean zero, it's really within a ball. It can be, is a bit more pessimistic, okay? Then basically what we want to show is uh, when you introduce this bias solution. So if you want, this is something like the, uh, among all to greater data is the one that minimizes this bias, okay? So is the one you would like to go to, in a way. So this is the setting I'm considering. And this is the classical setting of inverse problems. So and then in this setting, what you can prove is that indeed, under some assumption that we can comment if you care, is you can choose the step size of this mirror descent technique in such a way that it will converge to this minimal uh, bias, you know, the, the, the solution with minimal bias, okay? And the rates are going to be something like this. You have a convergence part and the stability part. I remember that before I was choosing the number of iteration as a function of the data, it's cardinality. Here you choose it as a function of the noise level in your data because that's somewhat the, the quantity that is, you know, uh, tells you the, the amount of perturbation you have in your data. And then you end up having this rate, which is, again, is expressed in terms of the noise, which is the standard thing. And it turns out that this is the good rate you should expect. As you did before, if you move from the basic dual gradient descent to the one, then you can improve not the rate, which is not improvable, but the number of steps you have to do, which goes from 1 over delta here to 1 over square root of delta here. So again, you see this effect, which is kind of a trade-off between uh, convergence and stability. In the case, just to be clear, in the case of accelerated gradient descent, you get the square here, which is what you expect from the optimization results, but you also get these worst stability points, which is something that is somewhat, uh, is a, is a somewhat uh, known in the optimization literature. Okay, there is a nice paper by Gleaner and co-authors, and here you somewhat see is, <coughs> It's a, it's the, the, the role of this observation, this trade-off between acceleration and stability from the perspective of regularization. Um, okay. Maybe I should say here I'm, I'm, I'm hiding all the constants, okay? And the constant will depend, uh, for example, the, the norm of your true solution, okay? And possibly some other parameter related to the problem. I just want to show you this to simplify things a bit because these are some of the main uh, quantity. Uh, There's a question about the assumptions on the noise. Yeah. On the on on the chat, if whether the noise can also be Gaussian. Yeah. So the, it, this result. So I would expect similar results to hold for Gaussian noise, but probably you can get something better because here the noise is is worst case is you know the. These two things are within a ball, whereas when you took Gaussian noise, on average, uh, it's small, okay? You just have the sigma. But in some sense, this is something like the sigma square. Again, it, it's it's a bit more worst case. So it's, I would guess, but uh, um, I think you should be able to do something a little better than this in that case. Uh, okay, so I need one more like uh, added question that is, so will it work good for natural as well as synthetic noise? Like, uh, What do you mean synthetic noise? So recently there was a paper of, of like a neural translation. So they produced a synthetic noise like white noise and all those. So, so is there any so here's the super worst case, right? If you yeah. if it, basically everything goes here with the with the maximum size of the noise. So it's, I mean, imagine it's a vector. You just have to know 
how far away the vector and that's it. So this can be really whatever, right? It can be Poisson, Gaussian, mix of the two. As long as you you know you have to kill the tails and and to say with probability one, I'm within a ball. Okay, so okay. it cannot be infinite. It probability, you know, at some point you have to know it's fixed. But inside you can do whatever you want. You can, everything can be closed, far away. It's worst case. Okay, thank you for that answers. Yep. Okay. All right. So, as I told you, the results. Just to give you an idea, you know, <laughs> these results are relatively recent, okay, in the sense that they all come out in the last four years, okay? And uh, the results on uh, dual gradient descent where come out, no, the role of acceleration is really the, the new part of the result. Uh, interestingly, perhaps, is that the algorithm actually does co reduces completely to gradient descent if you choose the, the penalty, the bias to be the Euclidean norm. And you should remember that you not you should not take this kind of results as physical law. These are results that are under certain assumption. You can improve them a lot if you change the assumption. For example, if you're in finite dimension, you get something different. If the noise is not worst case and is Gaussian, you take something different. If you assume that you have a sparse solution, you get something different. How different? Better. <laughs> okay, less worst case. Maybe you don't have to stop. Maybe you can let it go all the way down. Some notion of signal to noise ratio should matter here. So again, I'm just taking the simplified setting that somewhat amplifies all the possible instability and get you the worst possible rates. Okay, so if you want to go in and plot your data, probably this will not be predictive. Okay, maybe qualitatively, yes, but not quantitative. And so a big issue here, here somewhat declining, you no. Know, the, take a declination of this result in specific setting. I think one interesting one is when you start to talk about sparsity condition on the solution, interpolation, and so on and so forth. And lastly, I'm not going to talk about what one thing that we've been doing in between is to consider the case where you don't want to do these squares. You want to do something else. Okay? How do you go from these squares to something else? And here things get a little bit more annoying and you have, what are, you have to use what are called diagonal methods. Okay, and perhaps I'm going to skip this, and I'm, I'm happy to give you references if you're interested. So the thing I want to mention a bit, because it's the last thing we've been doing, which we've been, in the end turned out to be simple, but for some reason took us forever to figure out, was how to deal with purely convex bias. So your R is really convex, but it's purely convex. Okay, and it turns out that what you can do is simply shambol poke. So a primal dual approach. And uh, where uh, basically you have to uh, use the proximity operator of your convex functional. And again, the, I'm not putting down the, the assumption here, but it's a super simple iteration. Again, it's just a two step iteration. So, of course, the algorithm here is not new, okay? It's just Shambol Poc, but it's applied here. And so now you can go in and check what are its properties. As it turns out, if you want to do an analysis for a generic R, you have to decide a bit what's the natural metric you want to use, okay? And so, uh, one result which is easier to present if you assume your bias to be the L1 norm. Because in that sense, in this setting, basically what you see is that you get the results similar to the one I showed you before. So you get the result. You get the, the convergence, the stability. I'm sorry. Yes. No worries. Um, sorry for the rough interruption. There was a question about your previous slide uh, yeah. from Tim. Tim, want to ask your question? Sure. I was just wondering, uh, maybe I, I forgot to which problem you apply, Shamble Park, because usually there's two proc steps, right? You want to minimize F plus G composed A, and then you do a proc step for F. Is it? Yeah, this, this is it, okay? So basically, this is the problem. So you minimize this uh, function R, and then subject to these equality constraints, and you will pull it up as an indicator function. Right. And so the dual will become the, and so you just have the prox of R, because the other one is just a linear part. Right, but for the indicator, you would still have a projection step in, in standard Chamble. So uh, in, in, this is the way it's simplifying this setting. So I, we can work it out a bit more, but that's basically the basic form it has in this setting. Okay. Yeah. 
<coughs> because you don't have f plus g, but you essentially one of the you have f and the g is, is simple because it's just the linear constraint, so it simplifies. Okay. Okay, and this is the basic result, and this is result from now. Okay, and so basically the convergence part is for free. Okay, there's nothing new here. It's just applying Shambol Uh The uh, stability part, so the part where you where you want to analyze the error behavior, is basically based on another paper, very recent paper by uh, Shambol and Rush. They consider inexact uh, primal duo. Okay. So they show you the effect of if, of the of uh, inexact knowledge of uh, of proximity operator and so on. The main difference is that we we don't let this inexact knowledge go to zero. We want to keep it around. It's an error you have to live with. And so it will not disappear as the number of iterations proceed. You have to be stable with respect to it. OK? OK, and this I just want to show you to show you that you can do it. So you can also do the results for non just L1 norm, but something more general. But then you have to decide which is the metric you use to measure convergence because there is it's not clear what is the natural one. And so here you can do it in terms of the feasibility, the residual, and the quality gap. Okay? And so um, this is basically the standard way to analyze convergence in this more general setting. And you get a similar result. You get a combination between, it's a bit more articulated, but you get a combination between convergence and stability, and you can get the stopping time out of this. Again, I want to make one remark that I should have done before. These terms are really this this crazy instability terms where the where the instability explodes with the number of iteration are completely a byproduct of working in infinite dimensions. So in some sense, your your iteration when there is noise will diverge. Okay, so you have that if there is no noise, you converge, but if you there is noise, you diverge. So it's a totally worst case analysis. In in finite dimension, this will never happen. At some point, they will reach a certain distance. Okay. So again, I want to I want to show this because when if you see this for the first time, you might be fooled by you know believing too closely to these bounds. Again, these are worst case. Okay. So as far as I know, this is the first results where you take this bias to be convex, but not strongly. Uh, it does, does not reduce to GD. Okay. And it's the same stuff as before. Okay, we don't know. Uh, we are working on the case where you have some prior knowledge in terms of sparsity, and we really don't are not sure how to generalize to cost other than least squares. Okay, uh, and so that's basically where we are right now. So I'm more or less done. Of course, at this point, the question is, what about nonlinear models? Okay, but, uh, you know, if if anybody met me before, you know that. I just like linear models because they're simple. And uh, <coughs> perhaps the one take-home message you should get out of here is that even in linear models, there are basic things that we don't know, like how to enforce a bias different from the Euclidean norm. Okay. And the story here is long and short at the same time. And again, because you can imagine this is the case where there are three gazillions paper a week about this, but here I'm gonna show you a, a short picture. And uh, I'm going to postpone talking about linear models for a while. And I'm just going to go back to linear models, but this time for a classification. Okay? And uh, I'm going to introduce a problem that is standard. And the idea here is, so I, wanna, I will end up discussing a bit about nonlinear models, but for classification. And so I want to remind you the basic setting for classification. Here, the uh, data are just labeled plus or minus one. This is binary classification. And the typical problem is that you, you define this notion of margin, which is basically uh, the worst um, prediction you make okay, on your data. And then the notion of max margin is uh, uh, the among all the possible solutions, assuming that you can separate your data, the one that uh, uh, you know, has the best possible margin. Again, this is machine learning 101. Okay? But if you don't remember, it's annoying because you have to somewhat wrap your mind around it. But perhaps the nice result to keep in mind is this one. Okay. You can show that if you have a margin problem, it's equivalent to this min norm problem. 
And this minor problem looks very much like what we've been discussing throughout, because you have to minimize a norm, but rather than be subject to an equality constraint, you're subject to an inequality constraint. Okay? That's the only difference. All right, so now, if you listen to me talking of 45 minutes about how to do gradient descent for this problem, you could ask, okay, if I wanted to solve this, if I want to get an iterative methods bias to solution of this, I could do gradient descent. If I want to do a methods bias to a solution of this, what should I do? Can I do a gradient that will convert to this solution? What is it? Okay. And largely motivated by deep learning, this is something that has been asked. Okay. In the linear case, taking, for example, the logistic loss function. So what you do is that you just run, you have binary data, and you run gradient descent with a logistic loss function. And notice that this is a little annoying because the logistic loss function does not, the, the empirical risk uh, does not admit a minimum. It's a loss function that goes to infinity, but it never reaches zero. And so actually this algorithm will diverge, okay? It will not go anywhere. The observation was that even though is, it diverges, it actually converges in directions. And the direction is the same as the max margin solution. So in a sense, this answered this question, okay? Can you solve this problem with a gradient technique? Yes. For example, with logistic regression. How? The algorithm will diverge, but the solution uh, will converge in norm. And from an optimization point of view, this is really perverse. Okay? You take an algorithm that does, but then will converge in norm. It's not insane, but I would say it's not the first thing that comes to mind. Okay? And the thing is that, at least in the first result, and expect, because you just let this thing diverge, the uh, the convergence is super slow. It converges as over logarithm of t. And then in recent results, this is the original paper by Sudi, and then the recent result by GM Telgarki show that if you're smarter with the step size, you take a variable step size, you might get the one over t rate. So when we saw this, of time there's a, there's thinking, a okay. Question. I, yes. By Tim, go ahead, Tim. Yes, thanks. Um, can you just go back to that problem, uh, the minimum norm of W <clears throat> over these linear constraints? So, yes. Um, what I don't quite understand is there, there, are, there are many methods that you could solve that with. You can do it directly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, absolutely. What, what, what am I missing here? What, um, why this? Uh, no, it's a problem. Why don't you just why don't you just shut up and do it? Oh. You can do it definitely, definitely. Okay, so in fact, you know, if you if you were born, you know, this is just hard margin SVM, and there are three gazillion solver of this. Right. So if you want, I'm following the narrative that has been followed in the last couple of years to describe a set of techniques that minimize that do gradient descent on a given loss function. So I think about it as I presented. It, you st the way we did it is we started from this, which is just gradient descent on these squares, and we discovered we go here. Mm -hmm. So here, if you want, we ask, is there a loss function for which I can do gradient descent and will drive me here? That's, that's the question, OK? okay. And of course, you could, your comment is legit. You can say, okay, but why don't you just do this? Well, this is this was the question that was somewhat posed, okay? And if you want, it was the reverse engineer of the question, which was, how come when it, that when you do gradient descent of even in over parameterized model, you don't overfit? Okay. Okay. So again, you can start from this and say, where does it go? Or you can start from here and say, how do I solve this with gradient descent on a loss function? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah thanks. Lorenzo, can I add to that question? Of course. Adam, right. Is it because, you know, in some sense, we're studying these linear models as a model for something nonlinear and hoping these tricks will work in a, in a more general setting? I'm asking you. 
yeah. So basically, the idea, as I'll show you in a second, that in some sense, uh, th this will be enough to get the sense of what happens in for nonlinear models. So um, if you stick to it for a second, keep the question for a second. I'll show you this. That's my last point, and then I'll show you, and hopefully, we'll be clear enough. And otherwise, uh, I'll let us, you know, I'll, I'll get back to it. Simone has a question because he found the typo, so he should be right. So let's check. Bottom is uh, <clears throat> yes, of course. So it is the minimal norm. Ciao, Simone. Keeping me straight. That's good. All right. So that's it. And so what we wanted to know is like again, like Tim was saying. Don't Problem you can solve. You have many ways to solve it. Okay, so one thing we want to try is what if we change the loss function? For example, what is instead of the logistic, use another loss function, which is less crazy. For example, it does have a minimum. And the, the natural kind of classification is the hinge loss, which is annoying because if you let it go, there is no separating this. This the hinge will be a max margin solution. Will be okay, but not max margin in any sense. So what turns out is that what you have to do is that you have a diagonal method. That roughly speaking is a method that will solve the regularized problem, but as the iteration go, lambda will disappear. Okay? So you regularize, but lambda disappears along the iteration. So when you converge, it's like converging to basically the minimum norm solution among all possible separating solutions. And so the algorithm we consider here is the um, um, is a diagonal method, is idea of letting down to zero. <coughs> it's basically a dual proc. And, the, and you can accelerate this. And again, I'm running through the end of it, but the basic point in this case, you can take a constant step size and you can get one t convergence or one over t. Okay. And funny enough, you know, the paper that was studying this and it was just doing a subgradient method. For this specific problem, you would get the one over t to the one six, so super slow, okay? And here, of course, you get convergence both in direction, but also you get just convergence of the solution because the solution does converge to a minimum. Uh, this is in the spirit of gradient technique on a given loss function, but you could also try to solve the problem directly as, as was noted before. All right. I just wanted to, you know, this is the point of view of like more classical one. Let me tell you a bit why people look at this to begin with. And so the idea, so finally I'm going to nonlinear models. And so the idea here is that finally you get a function which depends nonlinearly to your parameter, but then you assume that it's homogeneous. Okay. Let's say one homogeneous, positive one homogeneous, meaning that if you multiply this by a constant, then you can pull it out, which is basically the property that you have with ReLU. Okay. It's a little bit more complex, but this setting here is the easy one to consider. Now, as it turns out, you can now generalize the definition of margin A4, where the main difference is that here, you see, I don't have my linear model, I mean, no linear model. And then the result that I showed you before still hold. The max margin solution is the same as the main solution based on this different classifier. And this is really the one homogeneity here that allows you to show this result, OK? So again, and in this case, is many people. But again, the first one, I think, was Sudri. You can do the same game you did before, OK? You did the uh, gradient descent with the logistic loss part that will diverge. And here, good luck showing easily that it will converge globally. Okay, it's not. It, I don't. I don't know if there is a result that shows that. But what you can do is say something like this: If the solution finds something that separates, okay, which might not be the case, you might get stuck to something else. Then, among all the separating solution, it will converge in direction to the max margin one. Okay, so it's not a convergence result in the sense of globally convergent, but it's more like. If you can ensure you get the separating solution, then you will select the max margin solution. And this is true for nonlinear models too. Okay. And here there is a line of work. Okay. There are several work uh, taking different perspectives. I'm sure that 
that I'm forgetting, but this is at least a subsample of this set. Okay, and this is at least one case. You don't have any stability result. You don't have any particular learning result because I think it's quite tricky to get good ones. But this at least is a first step to understanding nonlinear models in this classification setting. I'm not a related results for, uh, let's say, class regression setting or equality. You know, when you replace inequality with equalities. Okay. Of course, there is a huge list of results for nonlinear inverse problems. Okay but they really have a kind of a different flavor. And basically, so someone this is, this is it. So uh, basically, this is everything I wanted to tell you, okay? So in some sense, this was a bit of a tour. This is something, we look a bit of least squares. We also look at other biases. Uh, we took a little bit of fit with the classification case, but here basically you can play and start to go on. And so for example, I really think we should look more at the finite dimensional case. I think you will look at stochastic methods more systematically. And of course, no linear models and linear network and, and you know neural networks are the elephant in the room. Okay. So all right. Thank you guys. I think it's pretty much everything. Thank you.